Hello and welcome to HLA Live. Um, this is the second episode of HLA Live, which is our weekly program broadcast live on the HLA YouTube channel. Each week we talk to interesting people from the HLA community and beyond about the issues and topics that our community have expressed an interest in. We opened HLA Live with a, we opened HLA Live with a discussion on digital health. This was one of three episodes I wanted to cover on the digital health, entre entrepreneurship, and innovation uh, in organisations in healthcare topics. The HLA has six pillars of leadership that we deliver our programmes on. The leader is a communicator. The leader is a manager. The leader is a negotiator. The leader is an innovator and entrepreneur. The leader is a follower, and the leader as a philosopher. Many of the episodes in HLA Live will cover one or more of these pillars, and we want to start with the leader as an innovator and entrepreneur, as there's so much focus on innovation and entrepreneurship across UK healthcare. Today's episode features Owain Rhys Hughes and Hassan Chowdhury, who are kindly back this week to talk about entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship. Hassan is the lead for digital health for Healthcare UK and one of the country's leading experts in the field. He himself is an entrepreneur, and I'm sure since, uh, since his background is in social care, is an entrepreneur him, uh, himself. Owain is an ENT surgeon and the founder of Synapsis. For those of you that here, were here last week, you will know that Synapsis is doing some incredible work across health systems, looking at the interface between primary and secondary care. Given Owain's background as a practicing clinician, I'm sure he will have a lot of really helpful insights in the path, into the path of innovation, in the path of innovation. And many of you as clinicians will be wondering about many of the issues that Owain has faced in his career so far. So, Hassan, Owain, it's lovely to have you guys back. It's lovely to see you uh, back with us today, this week. So thank you for doing that. Um, maybe we should, uh, we, can, we will start with, um, uh, with Hassan and talk about some of those, uh, those early kind of transitions you made in, um, from social work, social care into your business and what, whether you had any of those entrepreneurship events that kind of really uh, drove that forward. Hassan. Uh, so thank you so much. Great to be back with everyone again today. So let me be clear that when it comes to innovation and every organization talks about innovation, most organizations don't know what innovation looks like. And if innovation was to punch them in the face and mug them, they wouldn't know what it looked like. They wouldn't be able to stand there and point it out in one of those lineups. Innovation is something that I believe very strongly in, but a lot of the time when we talk about innovation, the organizations that we've been in are moribund, they're rigid, they don't understand what's going on. So you've got lots of frustrated people who are seeing problems. I'm sure Owain is one of them, is sitting there thinking, well, this is rubbish, this isn't the way it should be, but how is that gonna change? And we end up having to leave these organizations in order to create that. Now, some organizations do think, well, we need to find a way to get this thing. And I'm, I'm cynical. You know that already, Johan, right? Um, I think entrepreneurship is vital because it helps that person who sees the problem. And I saw lots of those problems. And it means they don't leave the organization and it's cheaper than acquiring another company. And that's where entrepreneurship fits. It's for an organization that wants to do R&D but can't afford a proper R&D department or acquiring a new company, and it has to listen. And at that point, that's when entrepreneurship becomes a real thing. Mm -hmm. And that's the story of my career, where wherever I've been, I've seen problems, I've said, I need to get this done, can we change it? And as long as it wasn't too expensive, they considered it. So that's, that's what entrepreneurship means to me from a very personal perspective. Mm -hmm. That's great, Hassan. And actually, that leads me on to, um, I, I, I looked on Google what the definition of entrepreneurship is. I think we all go to Google for everything these days. So, and entrepreneurship came up as, is a system which allows an employee to act like an entrepreneur within an organization. Entrepreneurs are self-motivated, proactive and action-orientated people who develop uh, who, d who have leadership skills and think outside of the box. And, and you've basically summarized that in terms of your journey. Uh, um, yeah, Johan, what you've just given is the HR definition. Yeah. That's, that's the true. HR definition. You are an employer yourself. You know what that is, right? From the board perspective, this is, my God, we've got somebody who can fix this problem on their own steam. 
we won't need to create a new division. We won't need to sit there, set it up, hire someone on a six-figure salary. Hey, great. So entrepreneurship should be a win-win for everybody. Yeah, that's so true, Hassan. So, uh, Owen, what, what, tell me about like your reflections on on just the concept first of all before we dive into the conversation. Um, because uh, you know, as an ENT surgeon in the NHS, and given what you've done subsequently, like you know the, the work you've done, I can't imagine one day you were you know you were doing your clinical work and all of a sudden synapsis was born. I can I can imagine if you're anything like me, you know, you were you were constantly tinkering and trying to work out how to solve problems and you're just getting you know i don't know but i don't want to put words into your mouth so tell me more about that 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 period before like synapsis was born yeah so it, it was exactly like that really so i guess um you know pe people who are drawn to innovation and entrepreneurship or entrepreneurship are slightly different you know um and they do you know and i definitely think think of myself like this you know come up with ideas think you know how can we make it better you know, our high energy around that, you know, and, and want to want to um, to improve things for themselves and for, for everybody around them. But I think what Hassan is saying is, is absolutely right, that the culture has to kind of nourish that and, and support it. And, you know, throughout my career, really, I've, I've looked for environments that enable um, this way of working and, and you know, and for example, from you know taking time out to do uh, an academic clinical fellowship, for example, uh, and then uh, full-time research, and you know, research is an environment that's similar to um, entrepreneurship in a way, in that you are allowed to follow your own ideas um, and have similar similar issues around you know drag, getting um, resources in order to test your ideas. Um, the discipline that's required to test your ideas and, and get it into something tangible. Um, so I think that, that there are kind of avenues and, and often people do um, innovate in, in the health service side by side with doing research. Um, so I think, I think that often you know, academics are, are, are kind of entrepreneurial and entrepreneurial in, uh, in, in their approach to things. Um, but I think it has to become more mainstream than that. You know, it's it's often a, a parallel path, and it, and it certainly was in my my career, um, kind of a parallel path to the clinical work. Um, but I think they need to be more 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 integrated, and and you know, people who are, are who are drawn to innovation need to be supported within their organisation. So, like as Hassan said, that they don't feel that they need to leave, or the organisation doesn't feel that actually we don't have these people who think differently within our organization and we have to buy in some consultants. Um, so yeah, so absolutely, I've, I've been you know, throughout my career thinking about how to do things differently and, and trying to find avenues to do that. I mean, I think you're, I think you're, you, you know, you've really, you've, you've captured that, right? Because in clinical work in the NHS, we see, um, we often see people like people are always doing something else, right? Clinicians in general love to do other things, and and lots of them really, even when they're not explicitly in in this day and age, we all explicitly talk about portfolio careers and 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 having your kind of your side gig and all this kind of stuff, but it's always been thus right that that the kind of very senior clinicians have been researchers or they've been educators or they've done something that isn't they've gone into management um and yet you know we don't we've never really thought about we've never had that distinction in the way we do nowadays i guess um but they they do you know they were the, 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 there is entrepreneurship generally within the health service and yet um it does like something happens within uh, the health service when we talk about uh, the concepts around entrepreneurship especially from wider from other kind of spheres of 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 the of society and and it does die a bit of a death when you kind of start talking about it within the health system itself and I, I do wonder what it is about that um, and how do we how do we kind of foster that sense of of being entrepreneurial in your mindset within the NHS um, that allows the NHS to really like flourish in, 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 in the innovation side because one of the things I you know we talked about yesterday uh, last week was how difficult it is to initiate 
change in the health service, how difficult it is to initiate um, kind of innovation into the system. And that was often the frustration that was born that drew people to go and set something up, you know, I'm, I'm sure. But I, I guess what I, I mean, some of those experiences you had, Owain, like early on, like, like trying to get, um, uh, trying to get uh, quality improvement projects or, you know, because these quality improvement projects are the very basis of kind of entrepreneurship, aren't they? Yeah, I think that's that's a very good example. So, um, and you know, there, there there are a lot of innovations that have come along, you know, to, to know more, more recently, like you know the uh, you know the idea of quality improvements. You know, it, when I started, it was all audit, and that kind of evolved into actually completing the cycle. And, and what does that mean? It means you know um, improving the service and leaving something that's that's better. Um, but I think by its nature, you know. The NHS and and any health care organisation is is going to be a diff a, you know a difficult place to innovate because the stakes are so high, you know the stakes are high in terms of how busy people are, you know the consequences of things going wrong, uh, the amount of regulation there is, but I think you know I, I completely agree with Hassan, the NHS can't can't afford not to support um, innovation. They they have to bring it in house in a way and you know really utilize the resources that they have in 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 the, the workspace and i think the way to do it is to have um you know there's this idea in 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 development you know, in, in software development of sandboxing you know mm. a safe space where people can test ideas and obviously in order to get a sandbox and for it to be actually safe a lot of thought of has needed to go into okay what what, what makes that environment safe? You know, can who can deploy code into that area and it doesn't break the actual system? Um, but I think that kind of way of of, of working these the sandboxes is, is is an idea that the NHS would would you know, should look at. And in fact, they are. So uh, something very interesting was we were as a company we were part of a sandbox that the CQC, the Care Quality Commission, set up uh, to look at uh, digital triage. Um, so, you know, the, the regulator even, you know, the, 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 they, they were looking at new ways of working and, and they'd set up a, a, a sandbox that involved, you know, not just tech companies, but patients and uh, other regulators like the MHRA and so on. So I think this, this idea of a safe space um, is, is something that, that, that could be very powerful. You, know, you could have a, a safe ward, for example, where, you know, maybe they see fewer patients or um, and they can test ideas out in, 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 in that environment or, you know, a safe day in, in the GP practice where they see fewer patients. I don't know, but I think that, that mm. this sandbox idea is, is, is one way it could be supported. And I think that's really important for the for clinicians' satisfaction in work, right? That um, because every day, like every, I mean, my most of my work is around um, around either the HLA and working with a lot of young people who, or young clinicians, early stage clinicians who um, have got incredible ideas. And one of the things that I always find fascinating is that. Um, <clears throat> They come to the HLA almost in a way that they to give them uh, acceptance or permission to go and do the things they're doing. Right? They they like find it. You know, they need someone to say, "Why don't you try this?" Or just you know, "Don't worry about it. Go ahead. Do your do your thing." Right? And what I find fascinating is often that 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 need for that that safe space, as you describe it, the sandbox, the safe space to go and make something happen, um, which often tells me that these are people that could do it they didn't, they didn't really need the safe space we provide it's just that the safe space we provide allows them to kind of make have those ideas and, and take them forward but actually what they've already got the ideas it's how do they run with it implement it and make it make it happen and I think that's a that's a like something we really do need to somehow uh, capture this whole sandbox concept so how did it work with the cqc how did that how did it how did it practically work for you as an organization were the clinicians involved from the other side like were they involved in the in from the clinical side or um so so what it ha what happened with them was that you know the cqc like every other organization i imagine is extremely busy obviously um in you know, doing um visits and inspections to 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 organizations that, that they regulate so they're busy but 
nonetheless, they, they identified through those visits, as I understand it, digital technology that was being implemented, but the way that it was being implemented maybe was, was causing problems for that organization. So they really understood that there was a problem here. We need to pause. We need to you know, take resources, so some people, and set up this, this sandbox. And, and what they did was they uh, selected companies, and we were one of the companies they, they selected, um, but also, as I said, patient representatives and clinicians and the MHRA and academics and so on to talk through the problem and to come up with what, what does good look like and how should the CQC run their, their, um, their reviews in, in, in the future. So, you know, so, so that, that was kind of a sandbox that was safe in, in ways that people could be open and honest you know, and talk about, you know, what does it mean to implement a, a, a digital technology? You know, what's important to, to patients? You know, what is accessibility to talk? So it was safe in that sense. So it was safe mm -hmm. in, that, you know, people can, can throw ideas around. Um, and it was also in safe in that there was something concrete at the end of it. Um, so there was, you know, a report and that was going to influ influence change. So I think, I think this is an important thing as well in entrepreneurship is that effort isn't wasted. So yeah. I think there's a lot of um, work performance. You know, I, I use this term sometimes with uh, the, the, the people who work, work uh, for our company. I say, you know, don't do work performance. You know, don't you know, stay in the office if, just to show that you've been in the office. And I think there's an awful lot of that um, in training in particular in the NHS. Like you have to do an audit any audit, doesn't matter which audit, just do one every year, do two every year. <laughs> yeah. You have to publish. Well, do, publish on what? Is it, you know, doesn't matter, just publish, just get something. You know, and really, I think it, it's such a waste. You know, we should think, you know, what really is, is, is lasting in this work? You know, this effort that, that, you know, real humans with finite lifetimes are putting in, it needs to be, it needs to be important. You know, yeah. so I think, um, rather than do work performance, I think, you know, a sandbox will also mean that there's some, some longevity to that effort that goes in. And yeah. you know, th things are, are, people's time is valued and, you know, they, they work on something that, that's important you know, for the organization or for healthcare or for the NHS as, as a whole. Um, so I think this, safe, this idea of safety has, has many aspects to it. Mm. Ha um, before I go to Hassan, um, uh, just anyone out there who's watching this live, uh, you know you can go straight into the chat space. Uh, if you're registered via Medics Academy, you can go into the chat space or look on social media on Twitter or LinkedIn. Um, if you go into the into the virtual coffee room, you can ask questions, uh, and the HLA live team will will make sure that we we put them to the, the to our speakers today. So do go in there, ask any questions you have on this subject. Um, last week. We had lots of very interesting questions, which uh, which um, we tr we tried to incorporate into the discussion. But Hassan, going back to you, I mean, like like Owain has has, has kind of captured really, um, I think, a lot of clinicians' experience of that um, of that early stage of like awakening as you go through the uh, you understand you're asked to do quality improvement, you're asked to do audits and then, uh, and then, but they're done in a kind of very abstract way. They're not necessarily something you're necessarily interested in, or you're asked to, you know, you're, you're getting involved with research, but not necessarily something you're particularly passionate about. Um, how, how have, uh, like, talk about your experience of, of entrepreneurship at the earliest stages. Like what were you, what was the thing that really motivated you to start on the journey you ended up starting on? Because clearly the point at which you you're at now is like incredibly successful you're 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 you know you're one of our, our country's leading experts in your field and, and you, there's a journey that gets there and I'm sure it must start with that kind of that itchiness in inside an organization to want to see that change. Uh, now th thank you so much for your kind words I will tell you that the journey began for me where I didn't care right I, I was that guy that was wasted potential wasted talent left university ended up filing, right? Genuinely, I was sitting there in the summer break, just doing one of those admin jobs that you do, right? And I happened to do it at Hackney Social Services. And the frustration that I could see 
in the hearts and minds of those people who wanted to help their service users. I remember there was a guy, he was a locum, and I won't name him. And when one of his service users died, he did a fist pump because he had so much work to do. He just saw them as numbers. So that there was a class of people like that. Then there were those who really wanted to do the best for their service users. And the system around them was, ho was horrible, constraining. It made them do endless repetitive work. And it felt, and I, and I don't mean to belittle this, but people would say they had to do something. Let's call it X, they had to do this admin thing. And you'd ask why, I'd say, we don't know, but we just have to. Like it's an old religion where you've lost all the books, but you know you just have to keep chanting, right? That's what it was like in social services. The data, whatever data there was, it wasn't really much. I remember being in charge of it at one point for adult social services, looking at this data, thinking, what the hell is this? I was so frustrated. I ended up um, co-located with a GP surgery uh, in Lower Clapton, which is known locally as Murder Mile. And we were the social work team with the nurses, community nurses, district nurses, and the GPs trying to do MDT work. And the whole thing was a mess. And I was thinking, I would never want to have been working in this. And now here I am, I'm stuck. So the frustration at seeing real lives affected was what drove me in my career. Um, and, and I think that if you've ever seen people suffer, and you've seen their carers and their family suffer, their loved ones suffer, then you'll know that actually we have a moral imperative to do more. And that's what I think drives a lot of us in health tech, specifically in digital health, because we want to improve things with technology. There's just so much potential. And what can we do to save this? Why is it that we had to ax the facts not that long ago in the NHS? Why is it it's taken so long to become paperless and we're not still paperless? Um, I remember this was a talk in America where there were job adverts saying, we don't have an electronic patient record. And the reason why they put that in the job advert is because people knew that it would create 40% more work for themselves because they had an EPR. And so they would put that, they would proudly proclaim, we don't have one, come join us at this hospital trust. That's what it was like in the States. So technology is viewed actually as a, a blocker so much we need to find a way better and that that's what's driven me mm. and i guess the it's 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 fascinating when you talk about like those those really painful experiences you had early on right because I, I we all see that i think no any clinician that that can claim that somehow they lived in an absolutely pure environment where no mistake ever happened no kind of that, that frustration didn't boil up I think is 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 genuinely just not being honest with either themselves or the world right and the reality is that that frustration for some is what leads often to kind of incredible like negative emotions and and burnout and all the other stuff but for others it's the seed that like kind of drives them to do something and I I, I guess what I would love to know understand more of is how to try and focus people. I mean, this is certainly what our focus has been with, with um, the HLN and, and the work we've been doing recently is to, to really focus down on making those negative experiences, flipping them and turning them into positive things because it's through that adversity that we really see difference, we see change, right? And we've seen that with the pandemic. I mean, the pandemic has been like just, just an innovation like, you know, it's been a, a field of innovation, basically asking, you know, where people are changing things within the system. We're seeing like incredible movement that that has been possible for years and years. And yet nothing has happened with it um, in the field I work in, in digital education. Like, you know, all of the technology that we use has been there for for you know, for the best part of five years. It's just, it was never uh, taken up. It was never seen as a core thing. It was always a peripheral thing, but now we're forced to use it. And, and I guess the question really is, are we seeing within health um, the adversity being the innovative drive, or are we learning the fundamental kind of underpinning question, which is that we need to be more innovative and we need to absorb that in um it, actually one a question that came up from uh, james um related to a report that's just out um i, I don't know the report so I, I, I haven't read it um, about medical devices and how 
historically surgeons create innovations for and tools for patients in their garage, as, as James says, um, which but we're realizing now that these innovations and medical devices can cause greater harm, such as the vaginal mesh. And is innovation going to get harder in the future? And are regulations going to get tighter, stopping amateur on, entrepreneurs from innovating? And I thought that was a, a really interesting question because we were, you know, it's that it's that constant thing that that even that Wayne you kind of mentioned about how within the NHS you need within a health system that the 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 counter the risk is so high that you don't really want to just start experimenting liberally and you need to have that kind of safe space to do so so I, I don't know Wayne whether you want to take that up and, and, and talk about that further yes so um so I think you know if you're going to do anything to patients um then you know safety has to be the first thing um so you know regardless of the need to innovate you there needs to be very rigorous processes and regulation around that. Um, so, you know, basic things like, you know, informed consent, you know, uh, ethical review, you know, all these things are very, very important, absolutely critical. Um, and actually they, you know, a lot of people bemoan them and, you know, I think they, they should happen quickly. Um, I think, you know, there should be, um, very robust and efficient processes for, you know, uh, ethical review, um, regulation, regulatory process. But actually, they are so important that good innovation can only happen with them in place. Um, and I think, you know, th there's always this, you know, struggle between, you know, too much innovation will stifle, too much regulation will stifle innovation. But, but actually, I think it's about good good regulation. You know, mm. it's absolutely essential because if you don't have that rigor, what happens is that you have poor quality innovation, you know, innovation that's not rigorous. Things go get into clinical practice that are not tested, and funding goes to the wrong place. So I think we have to, as innovators, we have to really embrace that. Um, that 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 um, we have to embrace regulation actually. Um, I think we have to see it as a good thing for good innovation. It'll mean that, you know, patients are protected, um, but it also means that, you know, the work that you're doing will be robust. It'll be harder, but it'll be robust and it'll be time well spent because at the end of it, you, you will have something that, 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 that's worthwhile. Um, so I think it, it's, 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 a, it's a difficult thing to say and, and probably, um, Probably not, not not a popular view, I guess, among some people who would see themselves as innovators. They, you know, they see themselves as mavericks, and these people are just slowing us down and just, you know, give me the machine, and I'll just, you know, go and 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 apply it to this patient and this problem that I see. And you know, although although that energy is 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 admirable, um, actually, it's very dangerous, hmm. very dangerous. And th there there are many many examples, you know, famous examples where uh, clinicians that are well-meaning probably uh, have done an awful lot of harm to patients. So I think, you know, we, we, we have to be, that has to come first, patient safety, um, but actually done the right way, you know, regulation um, can actually make sure that good innovation and, and good innovators uh, will, 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 will spend their time um, better, you know, and funding will go to the right people. I, th I think that's so true because I, I, I you know, I see it, I see exactly what you're saying myself in that um, that w in healthcare it's not I think you know if you're innovating in um, in pure software for sales or for marketing it's the the outcomes are so um, are, are so uh, almost you know it doesn't matter the adverse outcomes aren't significant as compared to in healthcare where the adverse outcomes are just so significant and have such an implication on an in individual um, so therefore you absolutely do need to have that safety net to stop 
people just going willy nilly and doing anything. And I think that's so important. I mean, that's partly, I think, why for us, one of the reasons why I, I was very aware that I really wanted to, I mean, my key passion is around education anyway. Um, but education was a, a bit of a safer space because you've got an informed group of people. You're working with clinicians who themselves are often experts in education. You know, they know their stuff well. And, and, and uh, clinicians are the first to tell you when you're wrong about something, right? So it was a, it was a really good one. One of the things that we as an organization at Medics Academy did was that we've really, like we've been looking at every, every project we do, we look at how to create um, edu like research papers out of it. So, so that it's forced to go through peer review. And it was something that was, I was challenged by, or I was challenged listening to when someone, I'm sure both of you know him, Hugh Harvey, who's always uh, speaking, uh, you know, speaking about radiology and AI in radiology. He, uh, he talks a lot about the use of proper, you know, of research questions to answer um, the innovation. And, and I listened to him speaking at one of the HLA events a few years ago, and he really challenged the room to think about doing things Things properly as opposed to just the kind of cowboy techniques of that we see generally in, in, in tech where you just get on and, and break things and then just hope for the best that you can catch up or whatever. And yeah, um, yeah I think that's uh, really, but Hassan, I think you've got something you want to, you, you've got some, you've got an area here that you, that you can talk about. Um, earlier on, you asked about, are we doing enough innovation for its own sake rather than for adversity? I think we are still in the innovation because we see adversity stage. And I think that's a cultural problem. I think we'll return to that. On the regulation side, Hugh Harvey's an, an obvious contender for the person who's hit that drum the loudest and the most in, in the last year. And, and I rate him for doing so. Um, I would put a challenge though to what we've said so far. We need to protect the patient and we need regulation first, but we can't become anti-competitive or uncompetitive globally. So we have to be careful where there's a balance where we're making sure that there's rigor and regulation and we're making sure we're getting good evidence but not too much red tape and that's where we always have to have that conversation going so the primacy must always be do no harm must always be making sure we protect the patients protect population health but i do feel that sometimes the balance needs a conversation and there needs to be constant discussion between innovators and regulators mm, yeah Okay. I, uh, what one book I would say that 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 I'd recommend people to read is um, Bad Blood about Theranos and Elizabeth Holmes. I, I know probably most people listening ha have read it, but <laughs> I think that is that is a you know a warning for you know moving too quickly and flying under the radar. Um, and you know if you think about the amount of resources that company wasted. Uh, for, for what? For no, absolutely nothing. Nothing to show for it now. Only a you know a pending court case. Uh, so that should be you know a, 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 a warning for people. And why you know that company would have been better embracing the FDA in America. You know the the the, the, the relevant regulator as early as possible. You know and and they, they would have been forced to be very honest. And um, so yeah. So I think that that is a great a great book um, to to read. And, and bad blood is like the is the archetypal story, right? It's the, it's the ultimate example of just how bad, how 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 ridiculous, like you know that the the uh, the extremes of innovation can be, where you where you just don't pay any attention to reality and just go off and do your own thing. And I think it's 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 fascinating because in healthcare of all places, you. I, I guess the, that that story is the ultimate story that tells you that we do need a very, like a very, a much more structured, innov innovative sandbox, as you describe in healthcare, to allow people to innovate, but to do so in a way that is extremely safe. I mean, that's, you know, that's very much, that's very true. Um, Johan, a, Johan you know, we talked about the sandbox. Yeah. I, again, a cynical view, right? Okay. I think, and I'm not saying this about the CQC or any just digital or any public organization that has a sandbox, but you knew that but was coming, right? Mm -hmm. But industry has been calling for innovation from its public sector colleagues for a long time, and it hasn't got it. So the call from industry is so that there's a sandbox because that's what industry thinks is going to create the, the opportunity for innovation. So broadly speaking, historically, 
the sandbox has been a call from industry towards large organizations in the public sector to help them see that's what they need. But, but what I've seen really succeeds is not quite a sandbox. And, and actually, um, because Owain's offered a book, let me offer a book in return. Um, and this is from 1997 by Bennis and Biederman, Organizing Genius, Secrets of Creative Collaboration. Now, if you've not heard of this book, which I don't blame you for, right? It's, but it's academically cited repeatedly. It goes through what it calls great groups, groups that have achieved wonderful things. And it analyzes six of them, like the Manhattan Project. And when it does, in its last chapter, it goes through all the essential points, the take home messages. And of those 15 points, number seven is the most famous. This is why they're well known, Bennis and Biederman. Although Bennis is well, supposed to be a legend anyway. It's called the Island Bridge. Every great group is its own island, separate from the mainland with its own culture. Because if it started innovation in the mainland, it would have come unstuck. Because innovation doesn't flourish ordinarily because culture destroys it because it's just not ready. But if you start with an island far away and you follow the other points, the other 14 of these 15 points to make sure that works, you have an island, but you need a bridge. So that's why it's called the island slash bridge. Whenever you Google this term, you'll see it, the island bridge. So every great group is an island away from the mainland, but with a bridge to the decision makers who give them air cover, who are sponsors and champions so that that innovative culture can be brought into the main. Now you could call that a sandbox, yeah. definitely you could. But the way that Bennis and Biederman discuss this island culture is very, very different. And this is for me the best example I've ever seen of entrepreneurship explained. Uh, do I have the time to go through some of these points, Johan? Yeah, go on, go on. I mean, it's interesting. I mean, it's really educationalistic to this. So. Right. So the first is that you can't have a great group without superb people. And when they come together, they almost create the leadership style that they deserve. So the way that they are, if they're jokey and they want to be jokey with you, then they need someone who can play that game with them as well as be serious when they need to, right? So they'll create their own leadership style and then they'll develop and they need a strong leader, preferably from amongst them. They're unafraid of talent. So there's a problem we see in many organizations in the public sector where people who are deserving don't get the promotion because they're scared they're gonna make them look bad. They're considerate. So there's one problem you always find of the jerk who thinks he's brilliant or she's brilliant and they, they flout all the rules and you have to do workarounds because of them. So these islands remove these people. Um, they're mission driven. The island bridge I've already mentioned. They're underdogs. They always believe they have an enemy, right? Now, I don't mean that as in they believe that the CEO is a bad guy, right? But they, they will organize themselves in a way that's against something. Yeah. And remember, these are, this is with um, historical analysis of different great groups. So the Manhattan Project obviously was against the Nazis, right? They're incredibly focused to the point of being blinkered. Um, they're optimistic. Um, every single person in a role fits the role and their leader has this tendency to remove extraneous things from them so they can just focus on what they've got to do. They've a freeing leadership. They execute, execute, execute. They get things done and their work was their own reward. Now those are the fifth, that's a quick summary of that last chapter. But what happens when you read that book is it tells you that's what it means to be an entrepreneur within an organization, but away from everyone else with your own culture, having your own group, your own rules almost. And when you develop that way, what you have is special. That's, I mean, that is incredibly useful, uh, Hassan. That's brilliant. And, and actually, that does make me think, going back to what Owain said about the sandbox. And uh, Owain, I'd, I'd love to hear what you think about this, that if you imagine, like, is that, is that part of the problem, what, what Hassan described, in where industry is pushing for a sandbox? And actually, that sandbox, we've, we've been, you know, we've been testing out sandboxes in the NHS, um, like, every now and then. But actually, there's no impetus to then 
to actually take it further. There's no impetus to make that, to bring that innovation almost from the sandbox in-house into making it happen in the health service. Um, and, and that's the contrast of the sandbox compared to the pandemic, right? Because the pandemic has been this incredible um, period where we are doing things completely differently because we're forced to. And so innov innovation is just you know, run rampant effectively in the health service because we have to find um, um, we have to find that 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 solution or the solutions to the problems we have. So I, I don't know. What do you think? Owen? Because I mean, listening to Hassan about the island um, experience, I think that that kind of it, it contrasts quite interestingly with the sandbox concept. Uh, so I think I think the island and and the sandbox, in my mind anyway, are kind of uh, synonyms. They 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 you know they're the same thing. I think. And I think it starts with the organization understanding that unless they innovate, they are going to, over time, get worse and worse and worse at what they're doing, even though they think they're, they're getting better. So um, let me ex explain to you. So um, there's a guy called Clayton Christensen, uh, who, who's recently died, but he was a professor in, in Harvard, and, and he described the types of innovation um, and the two types he described, that there's, that there were three that he described, but, but two, one is sustainable innovation and the other is disruptive innovation. And sustainable innovation is getting slightly better every year at what you're doing already. And that's what the healthcare service is doing. Disruptive innovation is doing something, you know, he has a, a specific definition, but basically it's doing something quite radically different that ultimately is going to be so much better than the, the current way of doing things is going to take over. Now, if you think of examples where comp a company, a large company has applied, have, has, has understood what Clayton Christensen was talking about, this idea that sustainable innovation over time, if you don't have, if you're not aware of the dangers of doing that, um, somebody who's understood that it was Intel, so Intel, the chip maker. Mm. Um, and there's a guy, a famous leader called Andy Grove, uh, who led Intel. And if you think this is in the 1990s, where there was the, um, the Pentium processor. So there was like Pentium 4, Pentium 5. They were forever getting better. And they were by far the leading manufacturer of chip, chips in the world. So what you know, times was good. Everything was was absolutely brilliant, but Andrew Grove was such a, 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 a an, an exceptional leader. He understood what Clayton Christensen was saying. Uh, unless, if we just keep making the Pentium processor better and better and better, somebody else who makes chips a different way are going to take all our business. And he understood that that was going to happen. So what he did was he produced an he set up an island, you know, a, a sandbox or an island. So a team. And their job was to make a worse processor, effectively, a cheaper, worse processor. And they came up, up that team came up with the Celeron processor, which in itself became a huge part of Intel's business. But I think what he set up is exactly what Hassan was talking about. He, he set up an island, you know, with a bridge to the, to the mainland, a team that had their own purpose, and probably their enemy was business as usual, you know, the team that was doing. But I think the critical thing, you know, in the NHS, if, if you set up a team in the NHS, an island in the NHS or a, a sandbox in the NHS, you have to empower that team. That team has to be important. You know, even though they're, they're you know, they're doing something quite radical and they're doing it in a safe way, they have to know they are mission critical for this organization, you know. If we keep doing business as usual in, in the NHS, we know we're going to run out of resources. You know, this is a known fact that everybody who who's, knows anything about the NHS is if we keep on going along this track, you know, the, 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 the track is going to stop. You know, resources, we're not going to have enough. So everybody knows that. So we need teams like an island who are empowered and know that they are absolutely going to save the NHS. And but they've got to be, be able to think of new ideas, you know, and, and develop them and do it in a way, you know, that's safe. And, and as I say, another element of safe is, is knowing that their work is worthwhile. And, 
you know, the, 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 the organization will take it seriously. And it's not, you know, although you're, you're out on a limb, you're still one of our limbs, you know, and you're still yeah. critical to, to, to the uh, organization as a whole. I, I think it's it's interesting actually because this comes on to um, a, a question that one of the one of the uh, our, our, uh, the the people that Zach has asked in the in the virtual coffee space, um, which is around um, which is an interesting question around the private sector and the public sector and how that interface happens, and. <clears throat> And um, Zach's question is, if the private sector entrepreneurship becomes the main vehicle for innovation, will this leave the public sector more fragmented and more behind everyone else? And could it be better to drive innovation from within the system? And why is that so hard? And that question actually, it, it resonates with me because um, we heard last week from Anas about, um, about how his journey kind of happened. And he really talked about actually how he was working within the system and actually what uh, Patchwork did was very much spin out of an of a of a NHS organization. They've got this bridge into uh, because they're part owned by an NHS organization, and so they kind of built this almost uh, in, with that whole bridge concept of this of this innovative technology company, but very much still like with the with the values of the health service in you know embedded with it within it and coming up with those ideas. And I guess you know a lot of companies. I mean, certainly our uh, our company, and I'm sure when company you're you know you're very much embedded within the nhs culture but your city you you are trying you have to maintain that slight distance in order to be able to to make the change and, and there hasn't i i don't know is there an example where we can actually see it happening as zach asks like wholly within the health service and i i guess whether some like you talk about that um the in the intel the celeron team at intel and whether that's actually where we hope we want something like NHS X to go or NHS Digital to go, where they're kind of that internal innovative team. Um, but I, I guess, I mean, I'll, I'll pose that question to both of you and then because and, and, you both have incredible experience in this area. But the, the I guess the follow on to that for me is like the bit I do see in the NHS, which I sometimes I get very sad to see is often rather than being innovative, we are very quick at disparaging those that are innovating outside because some people are getting very frustrated and they go off and do their, they, they try and create change and make an improvement. And then others like spend their time kind of essentially, like instead of actually trying to out innovate them, they're trying their best to like kind of bring, kind of uh, to, I don't know, to undermine that innovation, innovative process. And it leads on to another question, actually a medical student asked about um, whether medical school culture in the UK is, is the competitive nature is, is so, uh, is, is actually negative for our, for our wider health culture and, and that need to kind of bring down uh, in, in innovation is, is actually a big problem but I'd, I'd pose both of those points to both of you and see where you want what, what do you what do you think um, I don't know who wants to go first Hassan so a, a quick one then on your question about private sector innovation versus public a, a big part of what you do when you create innovation is the size of your team if the team's too big it's hard to sustain that kind of mission driven um, absolute obsession and fanaticism to get things done so really you need smaller teams. And that's why sometimes you see skunk works happening, hackathons, because they, they give you the opportunity. But it's very difficult to sustain that. And public sector has a mission that it needs to do long-term. That's why the private sector has an advantage. It's got more resources. It can put some people aside, segment them and say, you're gonna work on this. So it's okay that private sector is doing that innovation. That's not a problem. We just have to find a way to encourage public sector to do some of its own. It's not an either or. Mm. And if we are going to encourage the public sector to do so, it's about culture. And, and I would say one of the most misunderstood phrases and quotes in business uh, is Peter Drucker. And everyone uses this phrase. And I, I don't find many people understand what they mean when they say it, right? Culture eats strategy for breakfast. Very, very common phrase, right? You've heard it before. You, you can try as much as you can to plan out what you're gonna do, but the culture of the organization, its norms, the way it works, the way it's expected to work, the unwritten rules, they will dominate. And because you can never change that, really, truly, it's gonna to be tough to change that. You're better off 
taking it away into a smaller team that's driven. And the public sector just has to understand that's, that's what it has to do more of. And, and us at Chelsea, and Chelsea's got a great culture for doing innovation separately. It's been doing work. Lawrence Petalidis has been doing that, that same talk 40 times around the world, uh, he told me. And genuinely, people have listened and thought, hey, and it was him, it was him that introduced the Island Bridge concept to me. Genuinely, that is what we need public sector to do. Mm. Owen? Yeah, I think I think the you know the story of um, Patrick and uh, and Chelsea's is, is is an absolute great one and and you know so that Chelsea essentially in the, there if you think about it they they did set up a sandbox in a way mm. they had a problem with staffing you know they set up a, I don't know, I'm sure Anas you know and um, you know came up with the idea I suspect and everything but um, you know. It, if you zoom out and you think, okay, what happened? They had a problem with staffing. You know, they, they empowered a group, a team of people who are highly motivated in a safe space, which, you know, doesn't bear much reputational risk to the organization because they're a, a, a separate company, but supported them, you know, realized that, that what they were doing was, was important to them. And now the NHS is, is, is benefiting from that because, you know, not only is Chelsea using Patrick, but they've gone, uh, I think to 15 trusts so far. So I think, you know, so, you know, I, I'm, I really focus on the fundamentals of, you know, what, what, what is important about the NHS and, and the important thing is, you know, free at the point of care, regardless of, you know, ability to pay, you know, it's, it's, it's about, you know, needs, not, not, not how much, how much you're worth. So provided that we can deliver that, uh, you know, free at the point of care, how we achieve it, I think we should be open to it. So we shouldn't have this divide of, you know, or the private sector or the public sector. It shouldn't be like that. It should, it should be about pro so solving problems. And if the problem is, how do we keep the NHS free at the point of care? Well, you know, everything else is off the table. Let, let's be, think openly about it. Let, let's, let's, let's try and solve that problem because that sounds like a big problem to solve and an important problem to solve uh, to me. And you know, if you go to extremes, if you think, you know, well, shouldn't the public sector do everything, you know, shouldn't they develop everything? Well, you know, that experiment has already been run, you know, it was run in, in the USSR for, for, for decades. And the truth is that, you know, as Hassan says, you know, highly motivated small teams do innovate and they do produce products that, 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 that people use. So I think, you know, we, we do need to, um, I think that, that, that really is, is the answer to, to, you know, make sure that people are highly motivated, that, you know, they have a way into to the public sector, they work in partnership with the public sector. I think that's how you're going to, we're going to get the solutions that we need to solve the big problem, which is how do you, uh, you know, deliver an NHS at the free point of care to a growing population, I think. I think um, it's it's about um, collaboration, really. I think I think you're both completely right. I, I think what we're seeing is this need to um, we do need to see this need to essentially create that same culture both in the public and private sector these small teams innovating and and genuinely trying to solve problems rather than worry uh, overly kind of worry about the mechanism and a lot of the hybrid solutions that we're seeing are actually incredibly like you know they're coming out of the health service they're, they're making those changes they're making those impressive uh, strides forward and it's really fostering those and promoting those um, and I think what we um, what we really can't afford is often to be so dogmatic in one direction or the other and I think it is about trying to find that that kind of the right solution to the problem um, and really try and celebrate the success within the health service because again that's something else i you know you don't sometimes you don't um some of the islands that hassan has described where you see real success stories we don't we're not very good at like just exposing them and celebrating them widely um and i think that's that's something that we do need to see much more of hassan i i think that um owain mentioned clayton christensen uh, and and i absolutely loved all of his work. He was an incredible man. And if you ever get a chance to watch his talk on McDonald's milkshake, it is, it is exceptional because 
what he's really talking about is having the space and time to think about why you do things. And if you're able to have that time just to step away for a second and be objective, you'll realize why it's gone wrong. And it's that objectivity that uh, he talks about when he says that we need to look at the job to be done. Uh, the point about the McDonald's milkshake, just to spoil it briefly, is it's not that people are buying a milkshake. It's because they've got a long drive and they're bored and they just want something to do. And they've got a free hand as they're driving. So lots and lots of people buy that milkshake. How did he come to the conclusion they had to do consumer research? But when they realized that was what they needed, it meant that they could do that through the drive throughs that's, that's the whole point. They understood the problem at such a level that the solution became easy. Mm. And sometimes when we're in the public sector, we're so busy doing performance reports and trying to get the day job done that you don't have the space and the time just to step away and think. And if you can do that, you'll realize that's why the private sector is able to do what it does in the early stages of, of its disruptive innovation. It's, it's thinking about it, then it becomes stale. Then another competitor comes along who reimagines the problem and comes in again. So how can we take that model into the public sector? You need people with the space and time to stand back, look at the big picture, to zoom out and think, why are we doing it this way? And that, that's what we need more of. And if you can do that, you'll, you'll find, there's very few examples. I think for me, the best example in the UK at the moment is Great Ormond Street and they have the drive unit. And I always get drive wrong, it's an acronym. Um, I think it's um, digital research, interactive virtual environments. Um, and it's a unit that has Microsoft, Samsung, NTT, um, and NHS Digital as its partners. It's separate from the hospital. There's no patients. It's clinicians, academics, software developers, data scientists, thinking about problems separate from the hospital. And when they work out what to do, they've got all the data at their hand, at their fingertips, they drip feed it into the ward. And at Great Ormond Street, all the wards are named after animals. So they'll drip feed it into the bear ward, for example. That's what we're seeing now as examples in real life, Great Ormond Street driving. Mm, that's really interesting. And I think um, that what that the, the other thing, the uh, I think the example I, I can I, I see in our in some of our work is that over the over the last four years with the HLA, we've had scholars coming in who have got some incredible ideas and they want to do uh, to kind of uh, to do their ideas within the health system right or they want to do it not they don't want to go out and start a company and go through the problems of of having to hire staff and hr and funding all that stuff they want to do it within the uh, within the kind of within a system that allows them to innovate and it's it's been the driving force for something uh, something where we spent the last uh, I don't know the best part of about 12 to 18 months on which is um, a, a concept we're launching in a few weeks time in a few uh, well a few weeks or months time called HLA ideas which is going to be the first incubator for social enterprise for not-for-profits right we don't because we've never seen one we haven't been able to find one in Europe which in the health space and so what we we kept having these scholars and you know the HLA scholars come from all over Europe we have them from you know from countries all across the continent and they they keep coming with these incredible ideas and yet everything is focused on trying to draw profit out of the equation and then i speak as an entrepreneur that runs a, a technology company a for-profit company but we, the, the a lot of them didn't they don't want that that's not their motivation they want to do something else and so what we've been trying to work out is how to create this this kind of incubator for not-for-profit ideas and so we, we've spent the best part of the year trying to solve it and and we're nearly there we're nearly at the point where we can launch it but it is a it is an incredibly like important factor that actually a lot of people want to be innovative. They don't really care about the the kind of the, the other mechanism. And often the things that drive a lot of entrepreneurs and intrapreneurs into creating their companies is because they can't find anywhere else to do it, right? And and I'm sure that's true of a lot of people is that they 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 need that control to make something happen, make something really important happen. And especially people that want to do things like long term, they're not interested in like the the two year or three year kind of exit strategy they're looking at this is their career and i think a lot of in in healthcare i certainly see that i think a lot of health entrepreneurs especially clinicians they're 
you know, they've committed their whole lives to clinical work. They're not, they're not shying away. And this isn't an easy out because anyone I'm sure Wayne can tell us, right? Going and, and starting your own company is probably the worst way of, of having an easy way out. So it's, it's, it's that desperate need to change and to make something better that often drives you to go in and, and do this. Uh, oh, Wayne, what do you think? I mean, I'll, we're, we're get, coming, drawing to the end of the, of the conversation, but tell, uh, you know, I'll give you a, a chance to do some, um, to kind of reflect on some of that. Yeah, no, I think you're, you're, you're spot on. I think, I think it's very important to understand what motivates people. And I think, um, you know, having control and, and having the freedom to follow your ideas and being valued, I think that is a huge motivator. And as you say, you know, people will you know, do a very painful thing like starting a company in order to achieve that, where, you know, if you can work out a mechanism, um, you know, within the health service where people can do that, you know, they, um, then I think people will should take it up. I think people you know, will absolutely be, you know, biting your, your arm off to, 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 to get it because that is extremely valuable. And, and it, it's actually not very common, you know, in, in, in you know, working in the public sector or the, or the private sector. You know, a lot of people in their whole careers don't, never feel that uh, empowerment, you know, and, and being able to pursue their own ideas and, and um, yeah, so I think I think, and if you can harness that, you know, then then it's 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 going to be something very valuable. And you know, if if you think of big organisations, you know, in the public sector or, or private sector, their problems are the same. So if you look at what Google did, you know, I know that's a that's a private company, but you know, in many ways, its problems were similar to the NHS and you know, a large organisation. And one of the things that that it did was give each of its employees a day a week to pursue their own ideas. And I think out of that came a lot of things that we use every day, like Google Maps, for example. I, I, I Gmail understand. came out of that. And like, like, yeah. every, like just so many things came out of that, right? And just, yeah, it's incredible that, 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 that innovation, the, the, the innovation of giving people time. Yeah, exactly. So, and I think, you know, so if it makes sense for Google, who obviously, you know, at the end of the day, they have a very objective uh, endpoint, you know, it, it's, it's absolutely gonna gonna make sense for for the NHS. So, I think absolutely the the, the you know the public sector ca can be incredibly innovative, but it has to understand what drives people. I think that that's the thing. So, you know, in 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 very you know old fashioned political organisations, then then things are you know it, it's hard. It's very easy to stifle innovation. So we have to. You know, take take this these ideas of sandbox or islands and have highly motivated teams. Uh, you know that can. What did um, Jeff Bezos says? They can be fed with no more than two pizzas or something. That's the <laughs> ideal size of a team. Um, then yeah, if 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 you can work out how to do it within the NHS, then then absolutely, I think I think you know you'll be inundated with with um, you know very talented people who who want to spend their time. Um, working on, on, on very important problems that, that is going to change healthcare for all of us. Yeah, and I think I think my my lesson from the last few years is the mechanism, right? That um, there are some problems that just require kind of capital, right? And that capital just cannot be deployed from within the public sector because it's so risky. Um, and then the other ideas that are that it's just it just is ideas, right? I mean, they just need to be done um, in order to improve the system. And I think one of the problems is often not finding that middle ground, you know, one extreme or the other, people that advocate for one extreme or advocate for, uh, for the other extreme. I think they're often do dogmatic in their ideas as opposed to solution driven. And I think that's um, one of the things I, I've certainly um, I've certainly seen. So, um, okay, so I, I think we're coming towards the end. I had a long list of other questions which I was going to ask both of you, but I've, 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 uh, I've uh, the conversation has flowed so easily, and we've uh, talked so much that I think we've we've come to the end of our time. Um, but I, I just want to say um, how much it's uh, how much I'm grateful to both Hassan and Owain for 
for um, basically taking the time out on their Wednesday evening to do this and uh, and joining us last week. And they'll um, we're going to be joined again next week uh, because this is a three episode series where we're going to be talking all around that pillar that I described at the beginning, which is the leader as an innovator and entrepreneur, because that's very much one of those six pillars that we've identified as genuinely making a difference in leadership is that ability to step out and no matter whether you work in the public sector or private sector or any wherever you're working it is really important we feel i feel or my t- like our whole team feels to to think differently and to work out how to innovate whether that's intra- as an entrepreneur or as an entrepreneur um, and genuinely drive forward solutions because i think if we don't then we're just doing business as usual and eventually as Owain says the the road runs out and we don't we don't end up like really making the system um, the, what we want from as a society, which is a, a really robust system that genuinely delivers care at, at scale to our populations. So Hassan, Owain, thank you so much for your time again. And you know, you really are honestly very kind to keep donating your time like this to us um, and to keep talking about these interesting ideas. Um, First of all, I don't know, Hassan, just if you want to have a chance to say goodbye and then... So I'll say one thing before I say goodbye. Uh, Take a risk. An entrepreneur or an entrepreneur, there is a risk. Understand the risk is different if you're an entrepreneur, but there's still a risk there. And if you ever get the opportunity to do it, go for it because you've got a safety net. So find an organization that is trusting, that will give you that time and go for the entrepreneur role if you ever get one. And thank you so much for hosting us. Okay, and Owen, last words from you? Yeah, so the, um, the same as Hassan, really. I, I would just encourage people to find somewhere where you feel supported and where you can, you know, if you're that way inclined, you know, if, you, if, you, if you're kind of a leader and you have your own ideas, then you need to work in an environment that will nourish that and will value the, you know, the input that, that you bring. So don't, don't stop until you find the, the right environment for you. Okay. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us and thank you to our guests, obviously, who just uh, always there. They're so kind to donate their time. Um, you will um, do tune in next week, uh, seven o'clock again, and we will have another com- uh, another conversation again in this, in this space. Uh, we'll be uh, talking uh, further about how to, that, that transition when you are at the point where you just, you do want to do something, you want to go and, and make that change. And the internal system is not working. So what do you do then? And what are the kind of the barriers that you need to be aware of that you are going to have to traverse in order to in order to su- succeed? And therefore, should you do it? So I think that's one of the big questions that we'll be dealing with next week. Um, and then following that, we've got a whole series of, uh, of events and, and episodes that are going to cover the full range of the HLA framework. So. Uh, the week after, one of our scholars, uh, Jessica Prince, is uh, hosting a really interesting panel discussion, uh, which is promising to be an incredible panel discussion uh, on, on bullying and harassment. And then we've got a whole series of events all on different topics, all on topics that our scholars at the HLA have kind of raised as interesting ideas, interesting concepts that they'd like to talk about. Um, some of them are going to be hosted by HLA scholars uh, or, or community members. Others are going to be, and we're going to bring in a lot of kind of uh, of lot of speakers from the wider HLA community that just uh, that have supported us and have, have always been uh, very helpful. People like Owain and Hassan who who give up their time freely to kind of to uh, ensure that this generation of young clinicians or early stage clinicians can really thrive and flourish in the in the future of the health systems and not just in the UK like we say we bring in people from all over the world as, as many of you know our faculty is 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 not just a UK based faculty we have people from uh, all over the world as part of it so do tune in I hope you enjoyed uh, the discussion today I hope you will continue the discussion on the virtual coffee space and do come back to uh, come back next week thanks a lot See you later. Thank you. Bye.